Welcome, welcome. We will be getting started in a few minutes. We're gonna let everybody come on in. We're glad to have you this evening. All right, so like it was saying, get comfortable. Grab whatever you might need to enjoy your evening for happy hour, whether that be a, a fun beverage of your choice. Um, I have sparkling water as we're talking about cars and driving tonight. I'm drinking some water, but festive water because we're going to have fun. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. I want to make sure everybody gets in and feels settled and ready. All right, well, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight for History Happy Hour on the Hoosier Motorist Collection. My name is Beth Brandon and I am the Manager of Education at the Indiana Historical Society. And it is so great to have so many of you on with us virtually this evening. Um, I'm going to go over a few details before passing everything off and really diving in. At the Indiana Historical Society, we are Indiana Storyteller, connecting people to the past. So we collect paper-based items such as books, paintings, and other collections to help tell Indiana's unique stories. We then find ways to share these stories through publications, exhibits, and events like this. And through these documents, we tell the diverse stories of Indiana and inspire a future grounding, grounded in our state's uniting values and principles. And tonight, we get to learn about the Hoosier Motors Collection with our guest, Kathy. And Kathy has been working with digital collections at IHS for over eight years now. Is that right? Yeah, I've been working here over eight years and just with digitization and also cataloging these old photographs and papers. So, yeah. yeah. So you're, and you're our metadata data specialist for the access and preservation team. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And that just means I write about the items that we put up online in our digital collection. So I, I handle thing, I handle all the old things, digitize them, and then I write about them and okay. share them. <laughs> yeah, as we are, you know, protecting and preserving yeah. and sharing. Yeah. And so a few logistic things before we really dive into our chat tonight. Um, Kathy and I are going to talk for about 35 minutes or so, and then we'll be opening it up to questions from you guys. So if at any point you have questions, uh, feel free to type them in the chat at any time uh, in the question and answer section of your Zoom screen. And we'll keep an eye on those and we'll kind of pepper them in as we get, as they come up and as we can and through the second half of the program. So if you want to add anything in the chat box, don't forget to make sure that your response is to all panelists and attendees. That way we can all see your thoughts. Um, keep an eye on the chat because we will also be dropping in links and URLs throughout the conversation. Uh, if I miss one, if our team misses out on dropping one in there for you, don't fret. I promise that in your inbox with our follow-up email tomorrow, you will get all of the links that we talk about. Um, so anything that we mention will be there. Um, if you haven't noticed, this program is being recorded. So you will be able to catch the replay on our website, indianahistory.org in a, the upcoming weeks. And that link is at, um, if you go to indianahistory.org backslash virtual hyphen resources, you should be able to, uh, find all of our collections of previous history happy hours there too. Now, if you enjoy tonight's program, I hope that you will come back, consider coming back for more. So next month, our history happy hour will be on June 7th, where we will talk with Indy Pride's uh, vice president and community or vice president of community and Indy Pride's director of education. So we'll be discussing Indy Pride, their history of LGBTQ plus charity work in the city of Indianapolis. Um, and 
really the exciting things and growth that they've had recently too. So sign up for that at indianahistory.org for more information about this and all of our other upcoming offerings and programs. There is a ton of stuff happening at the History Center and around the state. So definitely make sure that you check out that program or that calendar on the website. All right, so with all of that, let's not waste any more time and let's really dive in to the Hoosier Motors collection. Switch over. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Uh, you can hear me fine. Is yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, okay. I'll get started. I think. Well, I'm trying to move my. Ah, there we go. Okay, so this is the Robert Scroggin Hoosier Motorist Collection. Let's see. And so first, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the physical collection. And I have some of that collection right here behind me. Um, I have some old issues of the magazine. Here's oh, one yeah. with a really fun cover. I wish I was there. I want to put my hands on it. I know. <laughs> Yeah, um, so this is a physical collection that we have here. It was donated in 2015 by Roger, Robert Scroggins' granddaughter. And so Robert Scroggin was an attorney in Indianapolis. Um, he was actually born in Martinsville, Indiana, which is where I was born. And he um, moved around and then eventually came back to Indianapolis and he became the editor of the Hoosier Motorist magazine and also kind of the publicist but he collected all these materials, which includes um, over 400 photographs, and I believe they're all black and white, of early Indiana automobiles, roads, road signs, and road trip destinations. And the collection also includes about 83 issues of the magazine, which was um, I think a monthly magazine, mm -hmm. and it ran from, I want to say 1911 to actually it still goes today uh in the form of <laughs> yeah it still goes today in the form of the triple a hoosier motor club home and away magazine so oh yeah. i did not realize that those were this like the yeah. same organization all the way through so it's over a yeah. hundred years old yeah yeah so your little triple a card hoosier motor club that is huh? this collection <gasps> yeah. my mind is blown <laughs> I know, I know. I didn't even realize that myself until I really dug into the collection. Uh, so that's the physical collection. And um, I worked with the digital collection. We digitized this collection in 2016. And usually we don't digitize an entire collection. It's just, we have huge collections that are hundreds of boxes. We can't do it all. So then we select something representative of the entire collection. And so that is uh, what I have here on this screen. And there is an access link. So that's one of the links that we can definitely share with you. Um, and one of the, my favorite pictures is the little AAA Hoosier Motor Club truck. And I have called the AAA truck to tow me after a flat tire, after a or change flat tire, after a wreck we had, like I've definitely used my AAA card, so. Yeah. I like to see that they had this truck back like in 1920. Mm -hmm. um, so the digital collection, there are about 138 photographs online. And I am happy to report that I think we will be digitizing the old issues of the magazine too soon. So well, there's some beautiful artwork yeah. for those covers. They are and they're fascinating articles about roadways, about early auto club weekend trips and who's your destinations and all the old car companies. Um, yeah, so we'll dig into that a little bit more. Just a brief history of the Hoosier Motor Club. So the Hoosier Motor Club uh, then published the Hoosier Motorist magazine. So they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, so this club formed around 1902 in Indianapolis, and it was a lot of those early automakers and auto industry people, mm -hmm. um, and it was called the Flat Tire Club, and they eventually changed it to the Hoosier Motor Club. So Carl Fisher, who helped found the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, he was an early member, and um, at some point, a lot of these statewide motor clubs then combined 
and they became the American Automobile Association or AAA. So they all joined into the AAA um, community. So that's why they call it AAA Hoosier Motor Club. Okay, so it's like the Indiana affiliate of yes, AAA. yeah, yeah. So it's been around for a very long time, um, and it started as a social group. So the the mostly men at the time, but some women would meet up and go on little road trips. They were so excited about their new car. What can I do? But you know, they had to do a lot to go just on a road trip. Like for instance, a road trip to Richmond would take a couple days to get there and back have lots of flat tires and problems on the road because the roads were dirt. Like right. it was, it was really hard. So yeah. it started like that. Um, they would have lunch at the Claypool hotel to talk about roads and, and car issues and new car models. Um, but then it really morphed into an advocacy group for drivers and for roadways, uh, driver safety and that type of thing. Um, and like I said, it continues today as the AAA Hoosier Motor Club, and they have their services like emergency road service, they have insurance, they have still have the travel, um, the travel information maps and like discounts on, on hotels and things like that. So when these, when the social club was like planning their road trip and going for trips yeah. together, was it kind of like um, they were all there to help kind of like protect each other and yeah. the cars. I'm thinking about when I'm a cyclist. And so when we do long like century rides, mm -hmm. we have SAG support, which is, you know, we've got a truck with yes. us that has extra wheels and yes. grease and other parts that we need. Um, is yes. it similar to that? It's exactly like that. Yeah. There will be like a kind of maintenance truck that has a lot of extra tires, gasoline, oil. Um, they'll take mechanics or assistance with them. So the fellow in this photo, um, this is actually from a panoramic photo and it's in front of the Indiana State Fairgrounds. And it was a group that was going on a four, I think a four state tour. So it had all these cars lined up and they were definitely like, you would see these guys who were dressed up. He's got his goggles, his hat, his yeah. duster jacket. So, you know, the wind and the dirt, you get all dirty, you get dirt in your eyes. So that's like the typical early motorist costume. Uh, but then there were the guys that were, you know, riding in the back and get out and actually <laughs> crank the engine and change the tires and things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's exactly like you're, you're saying it, safety in numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was all a kind of trial and error back then and experimental. Yeah, so now we'll uh, dig into the, co the collection a little bit. Um, again, this is the Hoosier Motorist magazine, and these issues are from 1916. And so we've got one that just has a very beautiful country road. It was like a thing people would do, take a drive on a Sunday. People still do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and this other one is during race month. And back then it was called the International Sweepstakes. It wasn't called the Indy 500. So um, I, I don't remember the year it became the Indy 500, but uh, they've got the checkered flag and of course the Indy car. So I thought that was a fun cover. Um, and the magazine really was used to inform um, members and advocate uh, for roads and road signs. Um, they did have ads for cars, so you can see a lot of classic cars within these pages. Uh, they had roadway and safety news, so they would report on whether a road was passable or not. And really, the state of Indiana was not yet putting out this information, mm -hmm. um, like maybe in a newspaper, but there wasn't a state highway department until 1917. So the Hoosier Motor Club was really early in this, you know, to get safe roads and to get uh, safe cars and um, to worry about the driver's safety. And so they weren't just promoting this idea. It sounds like they were really advocating for it to happen at a larger scale too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they were, they were also advocating for um, tourism uh, around, okay. around this time in 1916, the Indiana state park system opened. So mm -hmm. um, they would have all of the new state park destinations and photographs of those in the the magazine. So they were also a little bit of a tourism board for Indiana. Um, they also had weekend trip ideas and they had hotel garage uh, 
and garage directory. So like, where could you find a place to get your oil changed in this, this town or a hotel to stay? Oh, um, yeah. I didn't think about how you wouldn't know that as you're trapped, like going on these long trips, yeah. you wouldn't have, you wouldn't know where access to those things were, mm -hmm. but you definitely needed to do that at a much higher rate than we do today. Yeah, yeah. So it really provided a lot of information for the driver to make them want to get out there and do more. Um, so I do, I have a couple example pages to show you up here on the screen. They have the laws for the motorist. And I'll tell you what the, the speed, the speed limit uh, suggestions are. So an example would be 10 miles an hour in business districts and 25 miles an hour in the country. <laughs> So much slower, much slower than what we do now. And uh, they also said drivers of cars shall stop when signaled to do so by drivers of horses. I think horses had the right of way. Right away. Okay. Yeah. And some people were resistant to cars. They were like, I like my horse and buggy. Thank you. You know, yeah. not, not ready for the car. Um, and then, of course, there was always news of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So here we have a page with some of the ED cars and some of the drivers of the time. Um, so people in Indianapolis have always been, well, in Indiana in general, have always been fascinated with cars and, and racing. And it goes back to uh, back even to, to these types of magazines um, showcasing that. And then the women. Ooh. They did include the women. <laughs> like okay. there are a lot of men in this collection. They did also want to include the women in the Hoosier Motor Club. So uh, they they had a women's department, a women's auxiliary, um, and so they had a couple of pages of each issue where they would talk about women's issues having to deal with cars. And I can tell you a fun fact about women is that they mostly. Well, they were more inclined to drive electric cars mm -hmm. in these early days because they weren't as messy and dirty as the gasoline and oil, you know, cars. So um, many women would drive their little electric cars around town. <laughs> they want to go on the country. The idea of like electric car. I mean, when we think about electric cars mm -hmm. now, we think of that as a very like modern piece mm -hmm. where you know when we're being eco-friendly and the advancements that we've made there but you're saying electric cars were really popular yeah yeah and actually the 19th at one time early like the beginning of cars it was split into thirds so a third of the cars were steam powered okay. a third were electric and a third were gasoline or oil and then, of course, gasoline went out because it had it could go the furthest distance. Um, electric cars were great. They just didn't have as much range. And that's, you know, still the same kind of issue we have today. It's getting a lot better, though. And and actually, I should say my my husband and I do have an electric car. So I kind of do feel like I'm a, a an automobile pioneer in that way. <laughs> but yeah, electric cars were around a long time ago and they were the preferred car of women. Um, yeah, so uh, that's just a little look at the magazine portion. And like I said, we do have the physical copies here in the library, and you can visit the library and look at those, but we should be digitizing those. Um, I can't say when, but <laughs> it's on our radar. But no matter what, if you do yeah. want to look at them, you can schedule an appointment to come in. Yep. Yeah, in the library. library and check that out. Yeah, yeah, and now we get to the automobiles. And um, that was a big part, you know, of the Hoosier Motor Club was not to necessarily advertise cars, but just get people enthusiastic about them. So there was definitely a lot of advertising of different car models, especially cars made in Indiana. So at one time, there were hundreds of car makers in Indiana, like just hundreds. I, I can't tell you how many exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they ranged in all different types of cities from um, like Anderson, um, South Bend, Fort Wayne, Marion, Kokomo, lots of different automakers. And of course, as time went on, 
um, only a few emerged as being really successful. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is a showroom. This is the Coliseum, the Indiana State Fairgrounds. I was wondering. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is a, just a showroom full of cars. And most of these are Indiana made cars. So if you went online, you could really zoom in and read all of the signs. But I know there's a Marmon in there. There's a um, an Auburn car. There's a coal car. So these are all Indiana cars. And so they would the motor club would definitely be involved in the car shows um, every year. And I'll, I'll show you some more of the cars in the collection here. This is Elwood Haynes and this he is in his 1894 Pioneer automobile and he was an automobile pioneer. So this was really Indiana's first car and he was one of the first car makers in the United States. And he was also known for creating a metal uh, alloy called stellite, which is basically what we think of as stainless steel. So it's a metal that's not going to corrode. <laughs> And okay. it was very helpful in cars. So yeah. he, was out of, he was out of Kokomo. And so he had a Haynes automobile company, but also had uh, the Stellite uh, company, the invention. So a lot of the car makers, like they first had a certain specialty, like maybe they made headlights and they made cars or they, you know, invented this new kind of metal and they made cars. Yeah. So it looks like kind of like a horse look horseless carriage. It does me. look like a horseless carriage. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then here's another early model. Well, this is a little bit later. Um, Cole was an Indianapolis car maker. So this is your little sports car, your roadster. Uh, and it's funny because this morning on the way to work, you will not believe this. There was, it was an MG, but it was an MG Roadster. And it looked a lot like this car right in front of me the whole way to work. Oh my gosh. Yeah, a little convertible. It was like light yellow. I did see it's an MG. I don't know where those are made. Maybe somebody in the chat can tell me where MGs are made. Um, but it looked a lot like this car. And I was like, what are the chances? Yeah. I'm talking about classic cars today. And I, I rode one in, or I rode behind one on the way to work. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is kind of a fun sports car. This is another Kolb that was fitted with a crane to tow cars. And so there would be a lot of garages that were like AAA affiliated. So if you called, if you called for help, they would come and help you. Gary says uh, he thinks that the MGs are British. Oh, yep. Yeah, and somebody else confirming. Oh, is okay. A thank car, you. Which also yeah. leads me to another question that we had in the chat. Um, Gary, you had asked about those being foreign cars and i believe you were referring to the electric cars um so mm -hmm. i mean we were talking about this mg as a british car but do you know what the relationship between foreign cars and indiana was i know that we had several car manufacturers in indiana yeah. but we were getting lots of foreign cars as well do you know anything about that i don't you know i don't know when we got the first foreign cars here mm -hmm. and that's a really good question that I could definitely look into. <laughs> we can and find out research on this. And I'm curious if it would say in the in the Hoosier Motor Club, like we are going to have a big auto show with the foreign cars, with <laughs> the Daimler Benz, or I don't know, something like that. So um when did foreign cars kind of come into to Indi on Indiana's radar? Um yeah, I'm I mean, yes, Gary, I agree. I believe it was with the Indy car racing. Um, yeah, that's true. Car racing, but with race racing. Um, that's true because no I, sure, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Because there were companies like Peugeot, I think it's called mm -hmm. pronounced Peugeot, the French car company. They definitely Peugeot had an early model, uh, in one of the early races. Um, this is so great that we have so many uh, car enthusiasts in this uh, because I may be an expert at collections, but I'm not exactly an expert on cars. Um, so yeah. I, I love it when folks bring their expertise to share with us because every, everybody knows so many different things. Yeah. This is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's see. Next one I have is a Stutz 5 passenger sedan. And so this was your bigger family family type car and they've got their wheel, a spare wheel on the back and it looks like a trunk on the back. 
looks like an actual trunk. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the wheels, the wheels to me, you know, with having this, the see-through spokes just, you know, reminds me of a wagon wheel and they just got thicker and thicker as time went on. Um, I'm sure as they made advances. Mm-hmm. Um, so Stutz was another um, car company out of Indianapolis, Harry Stutz. Um, and that building here is is just, you know, blocks from where I am right now at the Indiana Historical Society. So that's a, a really cool building that you can still kind of walk around and see today. Um, yeah, right, right off the canal, essentially. Yeah. Or just a just a block or so off the upper canal. Yeah, I, I, this next fellow is very interesting. So he is standing there with a Pathfinder, which was a car made in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Between 1912 and 1917, it was a short-lived car. It was a 12-cylinder, and it was known for being very reliable on longer road trips, so not as many breakdowns. Okay. So Ezra Meeker was a pioneer, an old pioneer, who had gone out west on the Oregon Trail. And so in around 1916, he wanted to do kind of a commemorative cross-country trip. And they lent him the Pathfinder and even fitted it to look like a, a covered wagon. I was just going to say, this car looks like a covered wagon. I need more details. <laughs> yes. And he does look like one of those old pioneers with the big beard. Um, yeah. So he went from Washington, D.C. to Washington State. And along the way, um, he did stop and kind of lecture about how he thinks there should be a national highway system. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's kind of a, a fun photo that we have in the collection. And yeah, I just can't imagine making a cross country trip in this, in this car. <laughs> and without a highway system too. Yes. That's yeah. sometimes forgotten about by, you know, some yeah. young folks who have had the highway system. Yeah. Growing so. up. Really, Indiana was on the map as far as car manufacturers back in the day. Um, They really had a big presence. Um, So, yeah, so we were talking about making a cross-country trip. And Mm -hmm. this is the condition of the roads. And there are lots of road photos in this collection. So this is a typical typical road around 1915 or so. You know, big ruts. Anytime it rains, they get really messy. I'm starting to like maybe pass some forgiveness on some of the potholes. I'm yeah. going to work today. Yeah, potholes are nothing compared compared to this. So this is the National Road, uh, also known as Washington Street, west of Indianapolis, 1922. And you can see the guy is trying to wedge something under this tire to get the car out of that mess. <laughs> so this is the, you know, they were trying to document like, this is how bad the roads are. We need Mm -hmm. paved roads, we need highway systems. Um, And then uh, we get to the road signs and uh, the Hoosier Motor Club was out posting signs before the state of Indiana was doing that. Oh. So yeah, there wasn't a a state highway association yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, What we know is NDOT wasn't a thing yet. So they were out posting signs about distances, um, warding signs, speed signs. What about like street names and things like road signs itself? I noticed that, yeah. I mean, street you don't signs see for, street signs, but... I think covered by the city. Okay. Street but when we're for... going like long distances, when you're driving cross country, or if I was, you know, leaving Indianapolis and going mm-hmm. up to Decatur, Indiana. Yeah. That's Adams the thing County, it was from town to town, it was kind of like maybe no man's land. And so the Hoosier Motor Club was like, we want people to know where they're going and we're gonna put some signs here. Yeah, okay. Um, So yeah, they're they're all about advocating for the driver who wants to venture out of town. And like, you know, it's getting, it's getting not to be, okay. So when I used to drive around as a kid or I'd noticed there's a cornfield between every town, like mm-hmm. that's what it was, I thought, okay, there has to be a cornfield between a town. So uh, not so much anymore, especially as the suburbs grow, but um, yeah, this kind of no man's land, there's not a highway system. Like if, yeah, you venture out of your town, you're not sure where you're going or where you can go to a gas station or um, anything like that, so. How uh, this? Oh, go ahead. 
how did they know where to put these signs? Where is there any documentation of people like putting signs in the wrong places? I don't putting, know. Putting I mean, them in the wrong direction. I just imagine somebody going out trying to be really helpful, knocking oh in the God. sign on the left side of a pole, but it should have been on the right side. I think they were pretty well informed and they they did draw and provide a lot of maps. So there's okay. a lot of maps in the magazine. So I think they kind of like went and mapped things out. Okay. And drew maps and and so yeah, it was a big kind of a big operation. So it was pretty um, trustworthy too of everything that yeah, they did. and the community of, felt that trust too. Yeah, yeah. And and so actually I think that I had the numbers on how many members they had. So in the very early days, it may have been like around 200 members, maybe mm -hmm. around 1910 or something. And then by the 1980s, they were well over 200,000 members. And I would say today it's probably well over a million members. Right. When I think about AAA. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I should find that out actually. Um, but yeah, here's, here's a, just another a sign that they had in the collection showing you uh, which way to go towards Terre Haute and oh and now we're starting to see some paved roads yeah yeah and, or at least it appears that way some infrastructure um, yeah. and then uh, we also have warning signs you know slow down for the school or uh, danger there's a body of water over here or um, speed limit signs so uh, this one is my favorite sign though. <laughs> Drive slow, you might need a fool. Yeah, that happens every day on the way to work. <laughs> so um, yeah, so they really did help the driver and they did also help the road systems and the highway systems, transportation in general. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a really great organization. Um, and my favorite part, I think for me is, is I like that travel aspect. Yeah. So they're wanting people to get out and explore. And so there's a whole bunch of folders of pictures of just scenery around Indiana and mostly from the 19 teens, 1920s of the road trip destinations. And so travel before, um, the, the little bit of travel that did happen would happen by train usually. So, um, for example, this picture is Lake Max and Cucky in Culver, Indiana, and uh, a lot of people went up there by train. And of course, there's Culver Military Academy, mm -hmm. and they were um, kind of a big, I guess, advertiser in some of these early issues. So they were they were advertising the academy, like, "Hey, send your kids up here," but also, you know, come visit, come take a drive up here. Uh, and so, here's like the Black Horse Troop in a in a field over there. Um, so that was one destination. And so now it might take two or two and a half hours back then. That's like a whole day to get up there. <sighs> it's one thing I love about living in Indiana is I can, yeah. I can go to the inns and I can go on a road trip in Indiana and I probably won't be more than three and a half hours away from home. Yeah. 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 And and so around uh, the time that this magazine started, so it started in 1911, in 1916, you have the Indiana State Park System that's established mm -hmm. with McCormick's Creek State Park being one of the first, or yeah. it, is the, it is the first state park. And that's in um, Spencer, Indiana. And that's actually a favorite park of my family. We went there for, you know, summer vacations. So this is an old photo. I believe this is the Canyon Inn. It, mo it looks much different than the current day Canyon Inn. Mm -hmm. And then um, part of the creek there. So um, really, I, I would say the state parks have a lot to owe to the, the Hoosier Motorist magazine for advertising. Like, Well, hey, and and it, it feels like just Indiana commerce in general yeah. owes a lot to yeah. Hoosier Motorist because yeah. of, you know, providing so much information about mm -hmm. tourism and getting people out and about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're taking your car on one of these trips, it's not a day trip, you're going to be gone for a little bit. Um, yeah. And everything that that entails, you know, knowing where, where you can sleep, knowing where you can go to an auto body shop, knowing where mm -hmm. you can get your supplies that you need, how mm -hmm. much work that takes just to go on a small trip. I never 
thought of before about how much work that would take. Um, Without the, the internet. <laughs> yes, that too. This was, this was the internet. Yeah. And I mean, you're spending your money to do all of these things and then you're spending it across the state and really what that would have done for our economy during mm. that time frame. Whoa, yeah. so much for this magazine. Yeah. <laughs> I love. And um, yeah, another destination, uh, another, well, in state park and now national park is the Indiana Dunes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I see this picture, I think if I were living in Southern Indiana and in, say 1915, and you showed me this picture, I would say that's Massachusetts or that's California. That's not Indiana, but yeah. just the landscape is so different from South to North mm -hmm. that uh, they really showed people what different parts of the state look like. Yeah. Yeah. And then we also have Madison, which is one of my favorite, other favorite places. <laughs> my, my grandparents lived there. Um, so Madison, of course, has beautiful Clifty Falls and this railroad area is called the cut where they cut through, uh, cut through the rock um, and took the railroad up the hill towards, I believe, towards Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really a favorite part of this collection for me is all the scenery of Indiana at a time when these parks were first opening. Yeah. So another thing that's really cool about this collection is even if you aren't an avid, um, you know, motorhead of some kind, there are things in this magazine that you would be intrigued by, right? Like I love state parks. I love the history of state parks. If I didn't care at all about cars, I do. <laughs> but if I didn't, I would still have interest. And I wonder how that impacted their membership too, of having families, um, yeah. you know, paying for memberships and things like mm -hmm. that. And really, again, broadening because mm -hmm. 200 people, when they started out 200 memberships, doesn't sound like a lot until mm -hmm. you think about how many people were owning cars and yeah. how many, like, actually, I can tell you, I do. I did pull up that number. Cause I was curious. Uh -huh. So in the state of Indiana, I believe in 1913, there were 56,000 registered vehicles 1913 really which seems like a lot but that's for the whole state and I feel like the Hoosier Motor Club started when it started it was really Indianapolis centric mm -hmm. so all these road trips are suggesting are you know based from Indianapolis right but I think that that membership grew after a while you know to be the whole state but yeah 56,000 registered vehicles by 1913. More than I thought, more than I would think. Yeah. Um, and Tom from our Southern Indiana, I, uh, I do love Madison. Um, it mentioned in the chat, like Madison is known for a railroad that climbs the, the steep hills up from the Ohio river. And yes, I believe that this image is, um, that perspective. Yeah. And it was labeled, uh, this la was labeled the cut. I don't know if that's what it was called, but it's, uh, it's obviously they cut right into the rock there. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the comments of chiming in. Uh, let's see. So yes, my destinations were my favorite part of this collection. Um, but going through this collection did kind of bring me back to my own family history. And, um, and I think that's what a lot of the collections here at the Indiana Historical Society can do. They can make you think differently about your own family history. Um, we've always had this old picture of my great grandfather in his first car in 1913. And this is your great grandfather? This is my great grandfather. So yeah, this is not in the collection. This is my photo. Um, but reading about the cars and looking at different pictures of the cars made me think of him and learning about so early cars this is 1913 this is in Oakland which was manufactured in I think it was in Michigan Pontiac Michigan or Detroit Michigan mm -hmm. and um it was known to be you know a pretty good quality car I don't know why he didn't buy an Indiana car but um he traded in his horse and buggy and got this car uh so he bought into the automobile this new technology um you know, he was kind of brave. He took, he took a chance on it. And 
I think my dad told me, and I think dad's on this, uh, on the Zoom, but he had two of these cars because it's like, you know, you have a horse and a backup horse, you know, and he needed to make house calls. He needed to deliver babies in the middle of the oh. night. You know, which is why he has a lantern hanging from his okay, car. Of all people to have a backup car, that is the person. Right. So yes. he had a backup car. Um, so I just think, oh wow, he, you know, he embraced this new technology. He thought I can save my serve my patients better when I can take a car out and drive all around the countryside. So he was in Dearborn County, and he was a country doctor, and I'm talking like he got paid in apples and chickens right. and milk yes. and things like that um but across the street um from my great grandfather lived our cousins our taylor cousins and so this photograph is uh this is what the taylors did they had the taylor brothers uh service station okay. so they had mobile oil gas and they had their tire trucks and they had a little general store inside. So anytime he needed, you know, any help with his car, he had his friends across the street. Um, well, that's convenient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this kind of show you shows you like a typical. So this is around 1920, this photograph. Mm -hmm. And so the, the guy standing by the mobile oil sign uh, with the hat on, so that is our cousin, Frank Taylor. And so he started up this business. So not only did he embrace this new car technology, because I, I believe Frank was definitely born before cars were a thing, mm -hmm. um, born on a farm. Um, so he embraced the car and he just said, you know what, I'm going to get into, get into fixing these things and building these things. And um, so, yeah, actually I should show you. So Frank, uh, he and uh, some of his friends put together a souped up Model T. They souped up a Model T to look like a Pegasus, like the mobile oil Pegasus. Uh -huh. And they took it as like a trick car and a parade car in parades across the country. And I, I have a picture, I'll grab it. Yes. Um, I actually, I think I've seen this before. Um, yeah, and it is. is fascinating. Uh, anytime I, anytime I can talk about Peggy, I will. So this. Yes. See, of course, there we go. Oh, there's a reflection. This, I don't know if you can see that. That is Peggy, the trick yeah. car. Yeah. She can do wheelies um, and that's Frank in the car. So in their spare time, when they weren't working, they were out in the shop building Peggy. So definitely had some car enthusiasts in my family. Oh my gosh. Um, also in the chat, we have John mentioned, you know, it'd be interesting to know if these were Bowser pumps, the gas pumps, um, mm -hmm. because the gas pump was invented in Fort Wayne. What? My mind is blown again. I didn't know that. Bowser pumps? Yes. B-O-W-S-E-R. Okay. You guys, you have me inspired to do so much more research now and yeah so the, yeah <laughs> this, photo, <laughs> this is a little village called guilford indiana and it is uh almost down towards cincinnati and lawrenceburg oh okay i can probably find out if those are bowser pumps i'm not sure um i wish i could zoom in but um i'll try to find that out because they might have gotten more supplies from cincinnati Mm -hmm. just because they were so close Location. to it. Yeah, but I'd like to think that they they were uh, clued into the Hoosier Motor Club. I'm not sure if they were, but they should be if they were. <laughs> yeah, so that's the kind of the last slide I had, but Beth, did you have any other questions? That... Yeah, we've had a few. Some of them we've answered as we've gone through. Oh, yeah. Um, if, I, if you had a question and we didn't answer okay. it, back in um i'll be going back through too so one another question that we had going back when you were talking about um the magazine stating where like garages were and things like that mm -hmm. i imagine cars were breaking down all the time right mm -hmm. like it didn't take much for a car to break down yeah no it was, was just based on those pictures happened. yeah um so 
but was it common to find a garage on the road or like did we have a lot of those or was that a pretty I difficult think, thing to source i think like every sm every small town probably had a garage like the one that i just showed you guys mm -hmm. um i can i can actually look at one of these directories you know and talking about the directory directories makes me want to mention um i'm sure probably most of you have heard about the green book um there was a movie about it but the the Negro Motorist Green Book was a directory specifically made for African Americans, and I believe it started in the 1930s because the Hoosier Motorist was a great source, but it really probably was not inclusive at the time right. of, of giving safe places uh, where everybody would be accepted. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what the Negro Motorist Green Book did. Um, and there was definitely a section, you know, for Indiana. But okay, so a hotel and garage directory, um, it's listing maybe 10, 20, 10 or 20 towns. So you might have had to pay to be <laughs> pay to be right. in the directory. Yeah. But like places like Attica, Connorsville, Evansville, Indianapolis had several, um, Martinsville, Lafayette, Kramer, South mm -hmm. Bend, Terre Haute um our list our listing places like that but i'm i'm guessing that most small towns are going to have a garage or mm -hmm. even kind of a guy that works out of his home garage you know right yeah so like that yeah especially and as jim pointed out too especially around the major roads mm -hmm. um, those main roadways that people knew to take yeah uh, would mm -hmm. typically have them you know another mm -hmm. thing that i think is just really cool about this whole collection is how um, how we're able to make connections to it personally, like how you have these pictures from your own personal collection, like mm -hmm. from your family. Um, and it made me think, you know, my husband's family back in Ireland, they still to this day have like multiple shops in a village, one of them being the gas station garage mm -hmm. um, and how it just, it makes you think about how people get into that. And, you know, it's a necessity mm -hmm. and families providing the necessity, but also how many people are involved with making that necessity happen. So I just think that it's really cool to be able to go through something like the Hoosier Motors Club collection. And there's a way that everybody can make a personal family connection and like oh, yeah. learn about their own family history and things like that from it, mm -hmm. which is just so cool. Yeah, it is true. Oh, and I see Tom, Tom wrote here, one of your first You Are There exhibits was about yeah. Hartford City. And that is true. Uh -huh. I think that was before I started working here. That must have been in the early 2010s. But yeah, we definitely had an early automotive exhibit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I see Jim says many of the old gas station buildings are still there. Yeah, and I love the the look of the old gas station buildings. And sometimes they're repurposed into things like restaurants and there it, is one um in the southeast side of Indianapolis in Fletcher Place. Oh, um, okay. That was repurposed very recently into a coffee house. Wait, was it the milk tooth? Um that's another one. Okay, so there's two in Fletcher Place. That okay. was a proper garage. The other oh, one was okay. a gas station that had a functional garage uh, a long oh. time ago okay yeah yeah but um no i i've just loved digging into this collection and um yeah it makes me it makes me want to learn more about cars okay okay early electric cars that were made in indiana um tom is asking about that i'm not Sure, but I, I can tell you, I know Madam Walker, Madam CJ Walker had an electric car. Mm -hmm. And we do have a picture of her in her electric car, but I can't tell you if she bought that in Indianapolis or not. Um, that's a good question. Waverly Electric in Indiana. Waverly. Yeah, it was, and Waverly, it was a Waverly. And it was. Yeah, so yes, it was. Yes. Her electric car was a oh, Waverly. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Yes, Waverly. Now I remember. Um, so definitely there. 
I hope, Rod, I hope that you saw my eyes go like, I know this car. I've looked at this I know, car a hundred yeah. times. I've given I talks know. about this car and I can't think of it. Thank you. Yeah. For saving my back. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, yeah, she had the Waverly. I remember that, mm -hmm. that photograph. So a lot of the photographs that you see online, I definitely wrote the descriptions for that. But I've done so many thousands that I can't remember all of the details about them. Yeah, and that's one thing when we first in the beginning mentioned, you know, doing metadata. Oh. That means all of like that information. So when you go into yeah. our digital collection and you pull up an image, you're looking at it and you're like, oh, I want to know more about this. That metadata is that information. So that's where, it, you know, when you're doing a search and you're searching for mm -hmm. Studebaker, mm -hmm. typing in Studebaker in the search, that's how all of this information comes up. And that's what Kathy does. Yeah, yeah. I have to know the date, the place it was taken, sometimes the address. How uh, do you do cities? that with something like this collection? Um, well, a lot of these photos, well, I don't have the photos with me down here, but a lot of the photos had it written on the back of the photo. Oh, okay. That's yeah, it was very nice. <laughs> yeah. And it even would say this photograph was used in issue number four, mm -hmm. um, you know, so this collection is great because there was a lot of information, but um, sometimes you will get a photograph and you don't know a thing about it and you just have to go off the clues. And that is very fun. Um, you know, you look for road signs, you look for license plates. Um, mm -hmm. You look at the people's clothing and you can date the photograph, at least from the people's clothing and cars are an easy way to date photographs. So now I feel like I have a little more knowledge of how to how to date cars and photographs but um it's yeah it's really fun to come uh, and show me a photo and i love to like guess where it was taken when it was taken what they were doing that's also one of my favorite activities that i get to do with students um our young researchers is present them with a photo and have them look for the clues and so you know i say this with kids but i also say it's my friends like well look for the clues that are in it, looking for the technology that's used, mm. uh, looking for the electricity, uh, mm -hmm. cars, the types of wheels that people have, mm -hmm. and to help identify the when, mm -hmm. and then what types of clues you look for for the where. Yeah. And the what is going on in it. Uh, yeah, and that's what I, I try to answer in my descriptions of each photo is who, what, when, where, why. Um, so I've seen a lot, you know, quite a few mention of electric cars. So this makes me want to write a blog about Indiana's electric cars. Uh, I really, so I think I'm gonna explore this idea more. Um, so people have thrown out Studebaker, Waverly. So I'm gonna investigate this and look for a blog. <laughs> I love it so much. Because yeah, and I'm I an electric car owner, so I'm an enthusiast. Um, so I could compare and contrast old electric cars with new, new electric cars. And I'm going to make sure that after tonight, because we're getting ready to wrap up here, um, I'll make sure that I save the chat for us too, so that if there's something that you are really dying to know, um, we can maybe include some of that in, in that blog post too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing about this awesome collection that I thought was just going to be like information about old cars, uh, mm -hmm. which to me is very cool, but <laughs> yes. there's so much more to it. Uh -huh. um, so thank you so much for joining us. Again, if you would like to check out the Hoosier Motors collection, you can find it in our online archive um, and we'll put the link in the chat maybe, or for sure you'll get it in an email tomorrow. Um, so thank you for joining us. And we hope that you'll consider coming back for more. Like I said before, our next history happy hour is June 7th, where we're going to talk with Indy Pride's Vice President of Community and Director of Education. And we've got tons of great events coming up from the Indiana Historical Society. So definitely get on our calendar and check those out. There are um, uh, tons of different topics coming up all across the state, got some great things. We will post this conversation to the IHS YouTube channel and our website in the coming weeks. 
not like tomorrow, give me some time, but I promise it'll be coming up there in a couple of weeks. Uh, so if you'd like to revisit any of our previous free programs, you can also check out the History Happy Hour playlist on our YouTube channel. Um, if you missed your chance to donate and you'd like to make a further gift of donation, we'll happily accept your funds uh, to allow us to continue to share these Hoosier stories. Um, and again, we'll try to drop that in or you'll get that email tomorrow. Uh, so you'll get that along with that email with links. There's also going to be a survey included. It takes about a minute to fill out. I'd love to know what you thought about this program and anything that we could do to make programs better. We, we do this for you. So we want to make sure that uh, we can get what you want out of it, <laughs> meet your needs. Um, so thank you so much. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you guys in the future. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>